Hi, everybody. I'm Megan Moran from the Oklahoma Public Library. Um, I'm the Assistant Department Head of Customer Services here. Thank you all so much for being here tonight for this presentation with Dr. Furlong. Um, Dr. Furlong completed medical school internship and residency at the University of Illinois. Um, she founded the Chicago Center for Women's Health with offices in Oakland, Bedford Park, and Naperville. To fill a void in the healthcare world with the purpose of providing a safe, compassionate, patient focused environment to empower women to live happier, healthier lives. And she is double board certified in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery and obstetrics and gynecology. And she speaks Spanish and English. So we are so very happy to have her here this evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to use the mic because we're doing the Zoom and so that the Zoom participants can hear me well. I am, um, I'm not really heavy into words, so we'll be I'll be talking a lot in the middle of the demonstration. Um, so perhaps when I get to that, I might see the front of the screen, so maybe that's how the Zoom um, people will see, but I don't know if they're looking at the screen here or are they looking at the slides themselves. The slides themselves, but I can maybe adjust that. Okay, that would be good because then it might make more sense. And if anyone has an objection, then let raise your hand. I might take my mask off. Is that okay? Are you ready? Would you prefer if I take off my mask? Would you hear me better? Okay. okay. Hey, plus this is my daughter's mask, so it's really small. <laughs> okay. Um, so I am a double board certified public and constructive surgeon. So what do I do? I, I fix female parts. Um, so I know there's some gentlemen in the audience. My lecture really doesn't pertain to gentlemen, but you can take some notes for the lady friends and partners you have. Um, so my lecture is pretty much about female bladder. Um, my, my background is ob dining and I did that for four years, and I knew I very early on that I like to sleep at night. So I went into a fellowship, and I did a surgical subspecialty, and I've been practicing for you know, about 15 years just in that specialty. Um, I've had my center for about 10 years. I have a couple of nurse practitioners. Um, I, I work with uh, an underserved patient population in one of my offices, and then I have a couple of other offices in different communities as well in Naperville. Um, my, my mission has always been to come to some backyard to, to take care of my patients because, as a double board pelvic surgeon, um, most of my colleagues are on Lakeshore Drive. You know, the North Shore, Northwestern, Rush, UOC. And so it's really difficult for my patients who are elderly or rely on transportation or their children or even, you know, even younger women who, who need my help to drive downtown, find parking for $30, get lost, look for the building, you know, if it's, it's all new and it's all different. So, you know, my goal was to come and stay into this name in this neighborhood. And I, I really love it and it, it's great. So today I was asked um, from Christ Hospital if I would come to a lecture, and they chose this um, this incontinence lecture for me. So we're going to be talking about incontinence, and if anyone doesn't know, incontinence is when you leak urine. What does it mean to leak urine? So I had a patient last week, and she's like, "I don't leak; it just all comes out." <laughs> so you know, we call it different things, but what ultimately what it means is when the urine comes out and you don't want it to. Whether it's you're getting out of the car and putting your key in the door, whether it's your washing dishes, whatever you're doing, your coffee, your sneezing, that is incontinence. It's the it's it's got you the urine comes out and it's on your pants. Okay, so we'll get started with this first slide. Okay, so the prevalence, um, and this is really important. And like I said, I don't have a lot of words here, but I talk a lot. Um, and I'll keep just, a, I, I'd like to keep just a real important thing to keep in mind. There's everything you need to know about a continent is here. And if you'll notice, the difference is one in four women, so 20%, can have a continent. How many age of 65? Plus or minus five, 10 years, really. I mean, it starts around menopause, where it starts to really deep up. But if you look at the second sentence, 
four and five women who are in a nursing home having continents. And there's a reason I put this on here. There's a number one reason for hospital admissions is because women are in continent urine and they go into a nursing home. So it's 80%. So this is a problem. This is a problem for families to take care of their loved ones. Um, this is a problem for women to take care of themselves, and it, it drives up hospital nursing home admissions. Um, and so it's it's important to know that there are treatment options and what are the treatment options, you know, what works, um, and how can we take care of it. Um, there are three types of stress incontinence. I, I threw in the last one here because I think it's important to talk about that nocturnal one. We'll talk about that last. So the first one is stress incontinence. And no, it's not that the stress from having COVID, having to stay home and wearing masks. This is stress like I cough. There's a, a push, you know, there's something that pushes on your blood. I cough, I jump, I sneeze, I run up a flight of stairs. You know, some women, they're standing up or they're walking and they leak urine. So that's stress incontinence. Urge incontinence is you're doing something and you feel the sensation that you have to pee. And you know you have to pee, so you're getting prepared to get to the bathroom, but between the thought of having to go and making it to the bathroom, it's too late for you to okay? So they're very different. So some women, so, and, and it's important to know those two are different. Yeah, someone say, oh my gosh, my doctor did surgery on me and I don't need them. And she had to make me like, my friend had surgery. I want what she had. But they're different. Just because the urine comes out, they come out for different reasons. And the treatments are greatly different. So who I would operate on in one situation, I would not give medication to in another situation. Okay? And then mixed in that, and some women are unfortunate enough to have both problems. You know, they get the urge, they see, really, and it's both. And, it's, and they're, they, they really are, are much more incontinent. Um, and then there's nocturia. Nocturia I put in there because I think it's important to know that when you get up at nighttime, even if you're not leaking, that is, it's not incontinence because if you're not leaking, obviously, if urine is not coming out, it's not incontinence. But I put it in there because it's important to know that if you get up more than one time at night, it's, it's abnormal. Right? And so I consider that part of an incontinence in terms of quality of life. Because I think it's really impactful if you're sleeping, you get up and you think, oh my gosh, I really have to wait for the bathroom. You go to get out of bed, you trip on your, your carpet, you know, it's it's dark, it's late, you're groggy, you trip, you stumble, there goes your hip, or you hit your head, right? So we, you know, I, I put that in there just because it's a it's a good public public awareness that if you have, if you're getting up more than once at night and you find that you're really sleeping when you're getting up, it'll be mowed by your bedside. Um, get rid of you know um, mats or the cute little carpets on your on your floor because they're trip hazards, right? Make sure you leave lights on in the hallway if you're leaving from your bedroom to the bathroom. Um, hopefully, you know your bathroom and your bedroom are on the same floor because if they're not, then you're running up and down the five stairs. And I don't like I told you in the beginning, I don't function well in the middle of the night, so I gave up obstetrics. So you know, it's really hard for, for anyone to get up in the, you know, in the middle of your sleep to go run to the bathroom. And then if you trip, of course, you're probably weak. Then we're back to incontinence. So there's really three types of incontinence. Okay, the stress, the urge, and then a combination of the two. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go So sorry that these came out a little bit tiny. Stress incontinence. What are the reasons a woman could be incontinent? She could be incontinent. Um, I don't know why it's not economical for conversion. That's, um, I don't know where that word came from. My, my apologies, but I got, I got something there. Um, that should be from um, pregnancy, and it should be a vaginal delivery, um, or if you're from childbirth, so being pregnant. I don't know what happens to that sentence. Um, it's coughing, laughing, sneezing. Oh, I know what that is. I had to read it from your, your direction. Okay, stress incontinence. It's not because you know you don't have enough money to pay your bills and you're stressed, or from your kids harassing you. <laughs> so it's really about coughing, laughing, sneezing, jumping up and down. Right? Yes, I, I took my kids to the park 
And you know, I, I had on my shoes here. I'm like, you're not gonna run play tag with us? <laughs> I'll stress out. Um, and so why do you have in context, you know, why, why does it happen when you're talking about these meetings? It's because the opening doesn't close. Okay. So it's as if I was gonna drink a cup of water and I never close my lips. It would just drip, right? So that's what happens in stress and continence for a woman. And I have some props to show you what that means. And I'll put this down later. I'll have bigger letters now. Urgent continence, having the sensation to go to the bathroom, but leaking prior to sitting on the toilet. And I and, and you know, there's there's the event of I know I have to go, I can feel that I have to go, but between point A and point B, I don't make it. Okay. And someone, well, some women leak a, a drop, and some women, you know, they empty their whole bladder and, and their pants get wet. And I have very young patients who do this. It's, it's not age dependent. Again, bacteria up more than once or night, whether or not you're leaking, right? So you can have bacteria with, with incontinence, and you can have it without. Um, and we talked about that. Causes for incontinence is natural childbirth. So just the, the passage of a baby going through the, the woman's pelvis changes all your ligaments and supports, right? Um, because the baby is quite large in their head size, right? My daughter was a little bone involved. Um, you can just being pregnant and having a C-section. The fact that the weight of a baby sitting in the pelvis is enough to cause changes in those structures where you can have incontinence. And those are mostly stress incontinence, but it can cause urgent incontinence too and have some nerve damage. Genetic. You know, you just have, you, your family has weak connective tissue, everyone has prolapse or things of that nature. Menopause, we do find that as a woman goes through menopause and stops menstruating and her estrogen levels decrease, she has less estrogen in the vagina, less estrogen in the, in the bladder, more urgency, more incontinence, less um, support of the, of the tissues. And then prolapse, and prolapse is a whole different lecture that we will invite you back for. Um, that's when organs come out of the vagina. So it says, if I walked around all day with my tongue sticking out, your vagina hangs out. And you look down and, and something pink and fleshy is hanging out. It's not a cancer, it's not a tumor, it's your bladder or it's your uterus or cervix. So if you've ever heard of that, that sometimes can cause incontinence because a woman might not empty her bladder completely and then she sits down and is that, or she lays down and is everything with gravity is removed, if everything goes back up, the bladder is really full and she leaks. Um, or she can have incomplete empty, um, a lot of different issues. But I put that up there because there are things to think about. And of course, you know, reasons that we really don't know, medications. I think I have another, another slide. Oh, yeah. Less commonly. Um, obesity, um, more for urgent comments. But yeah, of course, definitely for stress as well, I should say. Constipation, huge problem. A lot of my patients are really constipated. Um, if you look at, I can give you a little, little blurb about constipation, it's important to think about. When we look at the American diet, the average amount of, of fiber in our diet is nine grams. That's what we get naturally. If you're not supplementing with some cereal or some oatmeal or venom fiber, the amount of fiber, dietary fiber that's recommended is 24 grams. So we're about you know, two thirds low, lower than what our intestines need to move all our, our, our feces. And when you have, if you look at the, the pelvis of anyone, the pelvis is like the head, it doesn't expand. The rib cage can expand and contract, right? You take a breath, you're bigger, you exhale, it kind of shrinks. Your bony pelvis doesn't change and it doesn't get bigger. So when you put more stuff in that pelvis, like a baby and other things and lots of constipated poop, it pushes on other organs because there's not enough space. It's like a bowl. You can only fill a bowl with so much cereal before it overflows. You can only put so much in the pelvis before it overflows. And if your bladder is full of urine and it can't fill up because your, your rectum is filled with stool contents or poop contents, you're going to have bladder issues. So constipation is a cornerstone of management in any incontinence protocol. And we start to talk about ways of having you know, healthier bowel movements, whether you're going to eat an all brand cereal or you're going to do you know, high fiber, low sugar oatmeal, or you may add benefiber fiber metamine. So there's different types of, um, of uh, bran and there's different types of, uh, of fiber, but even soluble and not you know, any kind of combine at all. Um, you can leak urine because you have urinary tract infections. It's, it's kind of, you know, sometimes I get a patient in and she says, oh my gosh, you know, 
I just started leaking last month. Like, I woke up and I was leaking. Of course, you may have a urinary tract infection, right? So you test her, she has an infection. I give her five days of antibiotics. She's like, oh my God, it's done. So sometimes, you know, sometimes, and I actually have patients who have had infections for like a year or two. And they tell me, oh no, I've been leaking for a long time. And, and I test their urine, it comes back infected. We might have to treat them a couple of times because it's been so long, but then they're better, you know, because the infection causes the bladder kind of spasm. Um, nerve damage, that could be from just being pregnant. It could be from prior surgery, radiation, other things of that nature. Surgery, we have previous pelvic surgery, a hysterectomy, a C-section, um, colon surgery, anything in this area, even hip surgery. I have some patients with hip surgery that ends up with um, incontinence um, because our nerve endings for the bladder come from the back and they wrap around. So sometimes those, those structures can get injured. Um, how do we diagnose it? You know, how do we look at it? You know, first of all, it's a complaint. Um, I will tell you, I had a patient once, um, she came in to me for some bleeding and menopause. And, um, you know, she was a little unsteady, so I stayed in the room while she got undressed because I thought she might need a hand. And so we were chit-chatting and she was watching her take off her clothes and she had these double diapers. I looked at her and I thought, well, you're not bleeding that much. I said, are you, are you incontinent of urine? Are you leaking urine? And she says, yeah. And I said, you know, I have treatments for that. She's like, I'll take them off. So I care. <laughs> so I had it for so long, it's about me. I'm okay, I'd rather have these and, you know, not have any. And I thought, okay. So incontinence is something that bothers a person. It doesn't bother everybody, you know? So I took care of her problem and she was very happy. You could do bladder diaries. I personally like bladder diaries for a patient because it tells me what you're drinking, how much you're drinking. I've had patients come back and they're drinking, you know, 24 ounce Arizona green teas, of, you know, six of them throughout the day. You can't put that in your body and expect not to be good. That's a lot of volume, it's a lot of irritants, it's got caffeine, it's got sugar substitutes, or maybe it has sugar. So I like bladder diaries because it makes us aware of what we're doing to our bodies and what we treat. I'm not so concerned with foods, although foods can impact the bladder and it can make definitely cause some irritation and some urgency. But I'm really, really concerned about how much volume. Are you drinking a gallon of water a day? Or are you drinking, you know, six ounces of water a day? Because those are very different and they're both going to bother your bladder. One, you're not hydrated enough, and the other one, you're way too hydrated, right? So bladder diaries tell me what's happening. You know, are you getting up 10 times at night or are you peeing in the morning after you've had your two shots of espresso? You know, my cousin goes and she gets this fancy coffee from Starbucks with a triple shot fancy mocha. Oh my gosh, you know, I drink all of that. She's in the bathroom like, oh, for four hours. You know, so, you know, you look at her diary and it's like, well, if you drink that, that's what's going to happen. So, you know, it helps you tell, teach a patient you know, some of your behaviors are directly impacting you. You change some of those and actually have a better quality of life, right? Um, we do ultrasounds. Sometimes we look at the kidneys and we look at the bladder. Um, we look at the kidneys because sometimes patients might have infections and we want to see which are their empty well um, and there aren't any stones or anything impeding the flow. Um, we look to make sure that the bladder empties well, right? Because a patient can definitely have incontinence if they are not empty. It's almost like having a glass half full and you keep trying to pull, put a full glass in there to drink a full glass, because you're going to need a half a glass. It never really be empty. So we do ultrasound for that. We do a stress test again, um, you know, whether or not you cough, that sneeze, and you see if a woman will leak. Um, cystoscopy is an evaluation where I put a little camera up on where your patient will urinate right through the urethra, and it goes inside your bladder and gives you surveillance. Um, I, I really would reserve that for my patients who have a sudden onset of incontinence because anything that's sudden is not really normal. Unless you fall down a flight of stairs and you have a consequence from that, something sudden in the person's body is something that I really want to evaluate a little bit more aggressively. Something that's been happening over time and gets better with treatment is not something I'm so concerned about. But if someone comes in and says, you know, yesterday it started at 10 o'clock at night, right? They can pinpoint it. I want to, I want to do a little thorough evaluation as to what's happening. Um, Eurodynamics is a sophisticated test. You put into the office, and we put these little tiny catheters um, inside your bladder, inside the vagina, so no sticky pads by your anus. And we spend about half an hour watching how your bladder will fill and how it will empty. Okay, and so that gives us a lot of um, data to make sure that the nerve endings are stimulating the muscles to empty and that the pelvic floor is being engaged appropriately. 
Um, and that I, I, I reserve that mainly for my complicated patients that you know are not getting better with conventional treatment as well as my surgical patients. I don't want to take to the operating room gets that tough because I like to have a baseline before I do surgery. Um, treatments. Uh, depends again. Remember, we have a very, very first slide. It's very simple. It says stress incontinence, urgent incontinence, mixed incontinence, and then include a bacteria. So, depending on those, is, is where we're going to be for treatment. Behavioral treatment is like the bladder diaries. You know, that's something that someone can take home, do on their own, continue to monitor on their own, bring it into the office, and we can kind of review that and help them manage that. Behavioral therapy also has to do with triggers. I alluded a little bit to the Arizona, the United uh, Arizona tea. Right, so teas, coffee, sodas, alcohol beverages, anything with bubbles are all going to be urge incontinence. Not stress incontinence, but urge incontinence, the sensation. Why? Because they're irritants to the bladder. And maybe they don't bother me. Maybe I can have a cup of coffee or two cups of coffee, but the person next to me can't even eat that because caffeine is a very big trigger. The moment they drink it, they're in the bathroom having to pee 20 times. Kegels are the pelvic floor muscle exercise, cute, funny story. Um, talking to um, talking to a colleague on the phone uh, about Kegels, um, forgetting that my two young naive little children are in my back seat. So I said, "Yeah, you know, uh, you know, this patient was really, you know, sick, and her doctor said do Kegels that would never work. So I had to take care of her, and I took her to the operating room. Blah 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 blah. blah. My kids, and he'll be like, Mom, what's a Kegel?" Oh, right. I mean, and they, I, I swear they could spell it. You know, they were just so in tune with the word. And I thought, darn, you know, hard to be a Euro guy with little kids. So they learned, they learned terms a little earlier. But kegels are pelvic for a muscle exercises. And so some women say, yeah, I kegel all the time. I go on the, the toilet and I stop my ear and I do it all the time. And I stop doing that. I consider that a, a nice self-assessment to whether or not your pelvic floor muscles will work. The Kegel. Oh, look, I stopped my hearing. Great. Now don't do it anymore. Because it teaches the bladder not to empty completely. And long-term, theoretically, you'll have some problems. So I just tell my patients, don't do it. The textbook tells not to. But I like it because my patients who can't go for physical therapy, we can do behavioral therapy. You know, sometimes you work with a woman who can do a pelvic exam and really teach another woman how to do a Kegel well. It's expensive, and some patients don't have the means to be able to therapy their BD. They don't have the ride, they don't have the copay, and their insurance doesn't cover it. Maybe they have therapy for their arm or their knee, and they're, you know, they're out for the year of the therapy. I tell them, do the poor man's deal. Go to the toilet, and learn how to stop your urine stream. That will show you and teach you where your muscles are. But just remember, it's only to teach you, it's not to do it long term. Okay? So I like Kegels, they do work. For my young patients, Kegels are for stress incontinence. I cough, I laugh, I sneeze. My 40 year old was carrying around their kid's soccer bag and running back and forth to sports events and going to Costco. Um, I saw one of my friends, she was leaving Costco. She never saw me. Her cart was this high. And she's, you know, one hand's up here, one's there. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, Kegels won't help her, right? She, you know, she was having incontinence, you know, carrying all that stuff and moving it. You need surgery. So then there's an incontinence pessary. An incontinence pessary is a little, looks like a little frizzy, and it, it's plastic, uh, a resin. You can wash it with soap and water. It's not porous, so it won't absorb anything. It goes inside the vagina, kind of like a diaphragm back in the day or a tampon. So it goes inside, and a woman can put it in and take it out herself, or she can come to a provider and do it for her. Medications, medications are. Um, all of them are for urgent incontinence, and they all cause dry mouth and constipation, but they work. Um, there's one medication you can use off label that works very, very well for stress incontinence. It's Volta. It is um, an antidepressant, sometimes used in schizophrenia. But some of my patients really, really like it. They actually are taking it for other reasons. They might have some fibromyalgia, or they might be using it for depression, and they just bump up the doses. They love it. I have some patients who are about 375 pounds who I can't operate on, and my little four feet tall women who are very, very round. They can't have surgery. The instruments won't pass through. It's in Balsa. It's just awesome. These women, you know, there's no, there's no better treatment. Um, or we could do bulky agents. I didn't put that in there. They're not my favorite 
Because both mutants, when you put them in, inside of your vitro, you have to be, you can't be a young woman because you have a young woman injection. I do. Um, I don't find a whole lot of success, but some people are really good candidate for it. Interstim is another circuit, very sophisticated. I don't know if um, anyone is up on the literature for a week or two ago. The three gentlemen from Sweden, they have completely transected their spinal cords and they put a modulator very similar to the bladder modulator we use for the bladder, but they got a uh, neural implant um, neurosurgeons and they all three gentlemen are walking. The first gentleman was paralyzed um, with all the motor vehicle accidents, probably motorcycles. He was paralyzed for nine years, the second one for three years, and the third one for one year. They all had the surgery and all three are successfully walking for 24 hours of surgery. So neural implants work. They're, they're cutting edge, they're lazy. They do work for the bladder. They're not my favorite, but they're good. Um, it's a little bit uh, much for patients. Some people some of my colleagues do a ton of them. They love them. I tend to like Botox better. Botox, um, we go through the bladder for the urethra and we do these ton of little injections and it's really easy and the patient does have, doesn't have anesthesia and it, it helps up to 70%. Both Botox and Interstim, this one's done in an office, this one's done in an operating room, about 70% success rate. Very nice. And then the mid urethra sleep, that's a surgery, that's for the coughing, laughing, sneezing, okay? So very simple, you know, we want, you know, I, I, I like to keep things simple because I don't remember a lot of details. Um, and I think, you know, it's always best to remember a few things and we try to remember 20 things and not remember all of them, right? So the take home points again are, you know, as, you know, as we get older, we definitely get more incontinence, you know, prevalence rate up to 20%. And depending on where we go, you know, to nursing homes, it's up to you know, 80% of all the women are incontinent and either have catheters or in diapers, right? Um, and then the two types of incontinence. So I'm going to demonstrate. So I try to get a little earphones as well as for I'm going to put the microphone down and I'm going to try to talk really loud, okay? Having to filter the iPod. It's on the lap. Yeah, I can Culture to talk very fast, it's a cultural thing. So, if you actually, if you look at, at different cultures, different cultures, they talk at different rates. You kind of talk very, very fast. I have to slow it down um, because I'm just a fast talker. And we also talk very loud. And so, different cultures also talk different ways. So, you know, I think there's one culture that they talk very loud and very high pitched, and they all overlap. So, one person's having a, a, a whole thread of conversation while the other person starts their sentence mid sentence of the other person they overlap and so everybody's talking at one time and it's kind of like that in a puerto rican house and so my kid you know their their, their dad is, is white and i'm puerto rican and so my kids are like oh my gosh mom you're so puerto rican you're just so loud <laughs> and i said like yeah but when i get these lectures it, it works for me okay so here's my balloon this is a flat okay so if I was standing inside my body, this is pretty much how it would be. The balloon is what's going to fill up with, with urine. Okay. And so I, I always use this analogy in my office. My, my assistant bought me a couple bags and I'd take these to my office so I can show my patients now because I never have them in my office. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of excited. If you look at this part of the balloon that we develop for a children's birthday party, this would be the natural urethra of a woman. This is the part that you can see if it's open, all the air, it can't hold any air, right? I have to tie a knot in it. Of course, our argument here that we have a knot, but it does seal close. So I always tell my patients, there's two ways the woman moves. I'm gonna go. Okay, now you see I'm holding it close. If my seal with my fingers were not perfect, and I cough. <laughs> Achoo! 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 Because my seal's not perfect. It's always been a leak. Because I'm pushing, I'm coughing, I'm laughing. It's a one-time punch. Okay? That's stress 
and continent. It has to do with the urethral mechanism of closure. No, it's not going to check. This has to do with whether or not you have the monotonous or it's closed well. Okay. Now, if that's the problem, that's a unique fix. If a woman leaks because the muscles are squeezing the urine out, that's an urge. I got the sensation and I squeezed it out. Very different treatment, right? One, the opening doesn't close well. So when you're crossing or you're bending, it's just opening. It's like your mouth doesn't close and the water comes out when you're trying to drink. The other one is, right, you're pushing and it comes out and the muscles are actually pushing at your feet. Does that make sense? So to treat this person who's feeling the urge to pee, gotta go, oh my God, I gotta go, you know, like, oh my God, you can't get out of the bathroom, kids, right? You know, you're standing there and oh, forget it. It's so, it's squeezing so hard, it's gonna push all of it out, done, you see. Or you have a little, or you have a big, right? But that's because the muscles are being activated by the nerve endings. Those are medications, so that's the Botox, that's the, the, the people who are paralyzed, that nerve modulator, that's what they have to help with the nerve endings, okay? Or even triggers, because triggers end up stimulating nerves. When the opening doesn't close, it's surgical. It's surgical, it's anatomy. If I let go, it all comes out. You have to hold it close. So how do you do that? You do it with pressure, you do it with surgery, you do it with something that makes that opening tighter. It's, it's not that the, the symbolic medication, but other than that, there are no other medicines for that. So that's the function of a bladder, and that's exactly how it is. We fill up, the opening stays closed. When we sit down on the toilet, our pelvic floor muscles will relax, the bladder muscle will shut, and we eject all of the urine. Yeah. And then it's deflated, it stays closed, and we can go on our day until we fill and restore again, right? So we, we, instead of being like, you know, when we're kids and we just peed all day everywhere we walk, our bladder muscles just contracted, or I think of like my puppy that I house trained, I taught them how to hold it, right? So as we get older, we are to learn how to store our urine. And when we have storage issues, it's when we have issues with toxins, right? And either because the opening doesn't close or you're just down. And of course, you know, there are medical issues that can happen. You can have cancer and infection, but they're much less common, especially in Okay, so that's my lecture, and that's my little demonstration. I wish my little pump would work, but it will fix it. It'll fix it. I know, I have to sure, for sure. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, there and there. Would you comment not on incontinence but an overactive bladder where the issue is the frequency of it? And when you mentioned nocturia, nocturia is that implying it's only or primarily at night when you're sleeping, or if it occurs during the day when you just devour? What, what, just over nocturia and an overactive bladder. Sure. And maybe how it relates to encounter, or does it eventually lead to incontinence or not really dependent? Or? No, perfect question. Um, definitely more detailed than what I would put on the slide. Incontinence is like the umbrella. I mean, um, overactive bladder. You have your umbrella. So remember, there's stress incontinence. We're not going to talk about stress, we're going to talk about the muscles, right? When I squeeze that balloon, that's overactive bladder. Now, you can have a very good pelvic floor, right? and men, they have. Because of a penis, you have a longer urethra, so they tend to have they tend to have overactive bladder drop, where their bladder squeezes, their brain like I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. And you may not leak here. That's overactive bladder drop. Then when you leak, it's wet. Very simple, dry or wet. You either feel like you've gotta go. Oh my god, I've gotta go. Oh my, I, I just went five minutes ago. Oh, I've gotta go again. I drank a half a cup of water. 30 minutes, I have to pee again. I go to sleep, I'm laying down. 30 minutes later, I have to get up, I have to go again. Frequency by definition is more than eight times in a day. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, 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 
I, I, I barely ever go to the bathroom. I think it's my profession. I know I'm doomed for my future. Um, I've had a patient once who told me she went to the bathroom one time a day. I was very worried about her. She, <laughs> she said, well, that's just normal for me. She never came back. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's so bad. I'm glad I didn't that big. Um, but she, so some people, you know, will, will pee three times a day, and that's normal for them. But normal, really, it's every two hours is normal. So I have patients who come and they say, I have urinary frequency. I'm going eight times a day. And I say, well, that's normal. They say, yeah, but I used to go three times a day. But it's still considered normal, so I wouldn't treat it unless you really had a lot more issues, like it really affects your quality of life. But so frequency is, you know, I have some patients who pee 30 times a day. They are happy at 15 times a day. If they can pee once an hour as opposed to every 30 minutes, they're super happy. So frequency has to do with the brain feeling that muscle contract. Whether or not you leak is different. And overactive bladder, nocturia is under that umbrella, right? So everybody who has nocturia typically has an overactive bladder. What we say in medicine is the overactive bladder does not smooth. So my true overactive bladder patients typically have nocturia and they're getting up to eat more than once at night. Now, if you're sleeping an eight hour night and you're getting up three times, guess how many you're napping? You're like a baby. You're sleeping for two hours, you're up. You're sleeping for three hours, you're up. That's two times you're up. You're sleeping for three hours, are you up for the day or you went back to sleep for another nap, right? So if you're actually gonna sleep, you're, you're sleeping every two hours and you're up pee. And so if we think about that, I mean, I remember when I had my babies, you know, it was only 10 years ago, and I was breastfeeding, I was up every two hours. I was exhausted after one month. I couldn't imagine spending a year of my life having an eight hour night of sleep and you're up every two hours to go pee. And sometimes my patients say, I'm only going like a little drip, but it's enough to get me out of bed. You know, so what do I tell those patients? I tell them several things. One, stop drinking before bedtime, at least two hours. So for me, that means I stop drinking at like six o'clock at night. I, I go to bed really late. Okay. Um, the other thing, depends on what you drink at night. You know, don't drink tea, especially caffeinated tea. Teas. Some herbal teas give you a little bit of irritation to your bladder. Um, soda, anything with bubbles, anything with caffeine, anything with a caramel cola will irritate your bladder. Some people, the citrus and the tomatoes bother their bladder. So you have to look at all your dietary triggers. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet and here in the library you can probably review if, if, if dietary is really an issue for you. Um, so stop drinking foods two hours before bed. Watch what you drink during the day. If you have caffeine, we, we recommend one, one beverage of caffeinated uh, beverage a day so that, that your body can typically process. And then like me, but I wear support hose. And so these look like pantyhose, but they're knee high support hose. And so when I'm on my feet for 12 hours, like today, well, I get up at 4 a.m. So I'm on my feet from, you know, 16 hours, right? right after you go to bed, right? My, my ankles, if I'm wearing heels, might feel a little swollen. If my legs are swollen, and I'm going to do a little demonstration for you, because I always feel like I'm very visual, so when I do things, I like people to see things because I think they remember expressions that kind of funny and I fall off the chair. Mm -hmm. um, so I used to tell my patients in the office, you know, we're standing all day. Gravity is pulling everything down. So as I get older, my heart does not pump as well. Neither does my vascular system, right? So when my heart pumps blood out, that blood's got to come back and the gravity is, not, is kind of against me as I get older, and that blood is not coming back as well. And so a little bit of fluid gets leaked out, it goes into the lymphatics, and I get what's called edema or some swelling on your legs. You notice in the beginning morning, your shoes are like, oh, look, my shoes are big. I lost the weight last night. No, because by the end of the day, they're kind of tight, right? Because you swole, you've got swollen over the day, right? Because as you're standing or you're sitting, gravity is still pulling the fluid here. I have wheelchair-dependent patients right on their butt. That's where all their fluid goes. So when they lay down, this, all of this is mobilizing, and the body is reabsorbing. So I tell my patients, if you're not going to wear support hose to help 
help kind of massage and push up all that extra fluid. What you're going to do two hours before bedtime, is you're gonna put on your favorite program. And I always think of a marble. You put a marble on your feet here. Is that gonna to roll to your tummy? No, you've got to get your feet up here. Now we've got movement. Now all this water that's been sitting in your legs is gonna get reabsorbed. Two hours before bedtime, you can do a little kick, little, you know, cap, you know, pumps to really mobilize all that extra fluid. Your kidneys will reabsorb it and you'll pee it out before bedtime. So lower leg edema or swelling. And you can have a cup here, you can have a cup here. Maybe that's one toilet trip that you're gonna eliminate at night, right? And that's that might be a big deal, right? Um, plus, you have to remember as we get older, our kidneys are like beans. Does everybody know what the beans look like? Regular beans. A bean, if you lay it flat, right, it, it, it lays this way, but if you put it up, gravity's pulling and you only get function of the lower one third of the kidney. So as we get older, again, we don't perfuse or we don't, our, our blood doesn't go through the whole kidney as well. So when we lay down, that kidney gets much more, you know, coverage from our blood flow and it can filter more and you can, you can actually produce more urine at night. For those people who have sleep apnea, whether you're obese or not obese, a smoker or whatever with your soft palate, use your CPAP because your CPAP machine will keep your heart from making a chemical that makes your kidneys work too hard. So put your CPAP machine on. So you tell your friends, it's worth getting that CPAP machine because you won't be in the bathroom all night, okay? Because when you snore, you have some obstruction and your, your heart actually produces a, a peptide that makes the kidneys work harder to produce more urine. So those are little things that we, we don't think about. Right? So the swelling in our legs, very simple. It's gravity. It's working against us our whole life. That's why you know, I try to stay so that for the past year. So, you know, it, and we get older, our, 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 our body does not work as well as when we were 20. Our ability to, to mobilize and pull up all, pump up all of those fluids, they're going to collect in our ankles. They're going to collect in our shins. They're going to collect in our knees as we get older and older. And so you want to get that fluid out of there. And so you have to work, gravity has to work for you and then he can be up in the air. You, did that answer your whole question? Yes. More than you wanted to know. Yes. Why more than And I just want to be practical. Yes. 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 So you might be obstructed. So what I tell my patients, you have to clean. So, so that was one of my, my things. What are the causes for incontinence? Sometimes prior surgery. So sometimes we try to fix somebody, but it doesn't fix all the way. And it happens. And over time, our body changes. Our, you know, our, you know, we wrinkle over time. So our collagen, our support structure underneath our skin gets weaker. And as that gets weaker, other things kick in. So if you've had an incontinence procedure like a sling, and you're not empty, that sling may have got too tight over time. Or your actual bladder muscle is not as strong, right? Like I can't run as fast as I could when I was you know, 20. I'm still a runner, but I don't run as fast, right? So your bladder muscle may not contract as well, so it cannot empty as well. When I have a 70 year old and I know she coughs, flat sneezes, Unless she's really physically active, I don't put a sleep in her because in five years, she won't empty. She's going to get recurrent with urinary tract infection. She's going to have incomplete empty. She's going to have a slow stream. She might have some kidney pressure. Um, if it doesn't bother you, a woman can always lean forward and do not push. Just rest to empty your bladder, which is the hardest thing when you've had surgery. The reason for that. The reason you move over is because it'll open up your pelvis and it'll open up and give you a little bit more, like a millimeter more to kind of empty your, you know, maybe, you know, I'm just making that up the sound test, a millimeter more to empty your bladder. Um, but you don't want to push to pee. So my, I have young girls who are like, 
Oh my God, I gotta get back to the baby. Let me run to the back. No, 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 my baby's coming from back over there. Like, do not push the pee. Because how does the actual feeding work? It works when you push, when you pop, when you feed. If you push them to your bladder, you're gonna engage the sleep. You're not gonna have to eat well. They're gonna be running back to the back to finish that job later. Half hour, guaranteed. So I tell my patients one of the reasons to do that fancy test before surgery, because I wanna see what they're, how they pee, how do they urinate. When they sit on a toilet, are they sitting there and they're relaxing? Some people never use a public bathroom. They, that's one thing. But another thing is they're squatters. They go on the toilet and they're like, I'm not sitting up here, I'm squatting. They're squatting, they're engaging their whole public toilet, they're not going to end it. So there's things and habits we actually do that kind of are against us. So if you're not emptying the bladder completely, first thing you need to have done is look in the bladder. You know, is the mesh appropriate? I've only thought in all my career of one person who had mesh in her blood. And it happens with a great surgeon, very, very well described person. It happens, you know. Um, I had someone who, I had a patient who her son like had a seizure or pulled out of X out of blood, and she had just had surgery. She, she grabbed him with the blood and she whisked him out to the ambulance. She messed up her whole surgery. I actually saw her post op. And, uh, you know, she ended up being okay, but, you know, she ended up not being able to end because of that. Um, so we look first to make sure there's no stones, no tumors, no cancer, no mesh problems. Second thing we do, we want to see if you're functional. Is your blood most matched enough to really push back and push past that obstruction at the point? And if it is, then maybe you still need to be released. And maybe you're having overflowing toxins. Maybe you're having, so a lot of my patients who had sleeves 10 years ago, as they age, they've developed overactive. Because it's just the way it is. You know, as we get older, we get an old rapid bladder. We get more urgent, we get more pain, we get nerve endings, our, our muscles. They don't interact as well. We don't know. Um, that's why those neural modulators are so sophisticated and interesting. Um, because they mimic it. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned no pushing, right? No pushing, but I know the side is going to stop. I was talking. The moment that you push, you're going to engage that You can push here. I think the best thing for, you know, I have a lot of patients who come to me who had that problem. And, and some of my patients, they say they won't even sit. They'll just kind of get on the toilet, get on the edge, and they'll just put their elbows on their knees and just wait for it to come out. And something about this angle. And most of my patients who tell me they're obstructed from sleep will pee like that. Most of them. So, I, so that's like a classic for me. You know, I say, okay, you had a, you had a sleep. Tell me, how do you sit down and pee? What is your position? And I don't know exactly what their issue is. So, and then if, you know, not all the time, but if they're doing that, then I know they're obstructed. And then I get the fancy test. Then I want to see what their muscles are doing. You know, do they have other issues, like some fancy terms, like pseudo That's where the muscles actually contract and you're trying to get urine out. You know, it's like, it's like me trying to blow up the balloon. It would be as if, you know, if, you know, if I was the first if I was trying to blow up the balloon, but I didn't, I didn't loosen my fingers. So I never get air in here, right? So the air would never come out if your pelvic floor is tight and squeezy. So things like that. There's other little less common things that then you start to think about. But slings are tricky to release. So I always tell my patient, you know, if I undo your sling and your incontinence gets worse, then do you want to put another one in, right? So I loosen it. Now do you want another one? Because now you're incontinent and you're going to end up with big now. So it's a little discussion. It's a lot of discussion. And I will tell you, I've let, I've put a lot of, I've taken down a lot of slings. Um, as patients have gotten older, that they've not, they've just had those obstruction, obstructive symptoms. And most of them, surprisingly, have been super happy with having it released and had very little impact. But that's just the way, that's just a random, you know, one person at a time. There's no 500 patients study at a time. Very well. So it's a tough situation because the consequences can be mean that you leak a lot. 
So, you know, if, if you're not having recurrent infections, you're probably fasting well. Another thing I want to say about the function of a virus. Um, I'm going to take this balloon now, and it's very flat, right? Bell green, bell green. Oh. Hang around. Okay. So it's very flat, right? So you notice that the two walls of the, of the balloon are almost in contact with each other, right? Now I've blown this one up, and you can see I can I can practically keep out just a little bit more air, okay? Our bladders never completely empty naturally. Once they've been filled and they're stretched, they will not, they will always have a little bit of visual. So when I'm checking my patients to see if they empty completely, they can have up to three ounces inside their bladder, three little shot, shot, shot glasses of liquid, and that is considered normal. It is not abnormal. They can have that much water or urine in them. And it's considered healthy. It's 120 mLs when you drink, you know, those half liter bottles. Those are 500 mLs. So one fifth of that bottle, 100, is normal. That's a lot of urine. So I have patients who tell me, "No, no, I go pee and I can go back and I can squeeze more. I don't empty. That's everything. Do that. You don't have to squeeze it all. It is normal that the balloon stays a little bit inflated after after." That's just normal. It would stay like that. That's normal. It, unless you squeeze everything out, it's not going to naturally come out. So you can see that's just normal, right? It's going to stay like that forever. Okay, that's a normal black. You're always going to have a little bit of volume. Okay, so I tell my patients that all the time. Now, unless you push it out, so those are my patients who. You know, they have their little kids or their bath habits and they run to the bathroom and they pee real quick. You know, and then they run out. Well, it takes 40 seconds naturally to empty your bladder. 40 seconds. The time you sit down, your urine stream starts and your urine stream stops. Everyone has 40 minutes, 40 seconds, right? So give yourself that half a minute to empty your bladder and just chill. <laughs> you know, you don't have to push, right? What do you do? You know, me and I'm always doing something while I'm peeing. So, you know, I'm texting somebody, you know, so I just multitask and then I cut my time. <laughs> Answer an email. <laughs> so, yeah, fight of a mom with two kids. Yeah. So, does bladder density, does it fluctuate because of age? Like, you know, when you're younger, it seems like, oh, yeah. Hold it up. So, that the whole thing about bacon when you're younger is the function of overactive bladder. And, and the lack of for women in menopause, estrogen really makes you have more of a, an irritated bladder because you feel that urge to go more. I have some patients I give them a little bit of hormone cream inside their vagina, and that irritation, that sense of urgency and frequency diminishes rates. So it's a little bit of an overactive bladder that starts to get that more urgency and we feel like our capacity has actually been. It's just it's just a sensation that you want to go more often, but your capacity is about the same. The more you go, it, it's almost like a tongue, a tongue. You know, the more you eat, the more you want to eat in the bladder, the more you pull, the more you pull. So my patients who have a habit of emptying at you know two ounces or three ounces, they will develop that habit. And they their brain will tell them, uh uh, I can't go more than three ounces. So that's what I that's what I've been told to do. I'm told to do at this threshold, I have to go pee. So you have to untrain yourself. And some of that is behavioral therapy. So I have young girls that have these problems. Those are my young girls. They have very bad habits. They're, they're just very hard to treat because they're super derived. You know, they just, and they don't listen. They're just, you know, they're, they're dumb. <laughs> like a kid. Yeah. I saw a girl, you know, she came from uh, Rogers Park to see me. And I was leaving my office. And, you know, I just got like a little soft part. I wish I would get rid of it. You know, always gets me in trouble. And I saw the tears in her eyes. And I was like, why is that girl in my office crying? And I'm about to leave. And I then I go, I'm leaving, and she's probably missed her appointment with me. So I walked back over and I said, well, you know, are you scheduling an appointment? She's like, no, I just drove from Rogers Park. It took me an hour and a half. I just said, I'm going to go back home. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, you can't not see somebody who's been an hour and a half. Well, it's a young girl trying to bladder. You know, she's 
for both timing and policy inspection. She was very, very sick, but you know, she had these really bad habits. And I asked her to eat, you know, like 10 cups of tea, cups, a couple of diet cokes, a couple of Starbucks. And I go, jump in, jump out. You know, you just can't expect to eat McDonald's and have good arguments. You know, it just doesn't happen. So, you know, our young patients, that person can treat them is much different. And they have trained their body to respond. Um, as we get older, it's more overactive. You know, in our brain, it's, it's just feeling more irritated. But we can behavior train them by, so you can work with the therapist or you can do their bladder diaries and say, okay, I know that I've been going every hour. I'm going to try to go every hour to five minutes. So that hour hits, and you're going to breathe. You're going to kegel. You're going to breathe. You're going to kegel. Because kegeling, so I'll get real fancy here. The actual mechanism of kegel, when you sort of, when anyone, man or woman, squeezes their pelvic floor, it sends a signal to the spine. You know, that's fine. Take that signal to the brain, will be processed. Signal when you think about them. That signal says, well, right before we keep our, our bladder has to go. It says, I've got to go. The brain says, no, no, I'm I'm giving a lecture, you know, about incontinence. This is really not the time, you know. Hold it. Kegel. So it sends a signal to my, my pelvic floor muscle to tighten. The moment I tighten, another signal goes right back up to my brain, the bladder muscle will relax. And let it slow. So turn off the scalp. So kegeling is a natural way to actually turn off the bladder muscle. Not all women know how to kegel. So my poor women, who I'm trying to teach, who can't go to physical therapy for whatever reason, they don't have the physical means, they don't have the drive, they live alone, they don't have the money, they don't have the insurance. I tell them when you're in the toilet, try this process. But don't do it forever. But that can give you an idea. Some women never are able to. And then, and then, you know, if they're able to pay for it, they get a ton of electrical stimulation and that can help bring their muscles together and then they can think about it. But that's fancy and takes a lot of time. So, but there are techniques. It just takes time and it, it takes a lot of effort. Um, and, and, you know, you just have to be creative. And, you know, and it's time consuming, you know. For me as a surgeon, my schedule is different for surgical patients. You know, I'm, I'm seeing someone taking them to the operating room and I work with them, I do my procedure and I see them, I take them to the operating room, I bring them back. I don't have time to overact the bladder because that's a lot of hands-on management. If I have my nurse practitioner do a lot of that education because they can actually sit down with the patient for 30 minutes and say, okay, let's look at your diet. Let's talk about the food you drink. You know, when are you really thirsty? You know, and then they can say, okay, well, you know, you're, you know, some people, they've got to have that last sip of the, you ever pick up your, your coffee or whatever you drink, you're like, oh my God, I already drank it, you know? You're like, you still want that last sip, right? You're like, you just feel jip. So I tell my patients, what happens is it's in our brains. We have these cups, and we're used to these cups, and we're used to drinking the whole cup, a smaller cup. So if you're a person who drinks too much fluid, get smaller cups, because then you're going to have that sensation of completeness of, of emptying that whole cup. So then, you know, there's things that my, that my, Nurse practitioners, I talk to them about the kegel, the legs up in the air on a pillow, the support holes. These support holes are amazing. I have these, so I, I'm not, I, I say I'm really cheap, but part of it is because I love my fingers and I don't like going up things that are so functional. I have sewed my toes over a few times and have the toes. They're like five years old and they have the best support. They're still support. So I like them out. And my husband always laughs at me. She comes over and says, Why do you got like, so I'm a surgeon. Of course, I'm going to sew my socks. <laughs> but they're great. They last forever. They were twenty five dollars. I've had them in three, four years, maybe five. You know, they're great socks. You know, I wear them every day, but I wear them when I know I'm going to be active in the water. They help a lot. They're knee high. My pants are tight, so I can't show you. They're band squat. So some patients, you have to be really careful. Some people, what they do is what they put on their kids. Their stock, they roll. And it's like a rubber band. You don't want to do that. You want to have a rubber band around your calf or around your ankle. Those will not, they, they, will, they will stop what you want to do. They make your problem worse. So I like these. These are Joe, like, um, I'm pushing, I need to get to Joe's, um, Joe's 
I don't know if it's um, but these these are jokes that made have a really wide band. They're cheap, they last forever, you can sew them, they're totally metable, they're very, very comfortable. So we're watching the shoes and we're doing Yeah. Did you get them? Are they online? Online, super easy. They usually have like five free, get one free. And they, they actually have a whole catalog. And you don't need a prescription, some of them do. They're about 25, maybe I mean, they might be 30 now, but they're between 20 and 30 dollars at any time. And they have the band. I have purchased the ones that are a little bit thicker, like men's socks, like trouser socks, and I love those. I didn't have a black on them, but I could like them. Those wore off a little bit, a little bit faster than those. And these are holes. Um, yeah. You know, um, you know, we were talking about, you know, like missing lots like that, you know, but I mean, the people who are older are not older people are being older. Right. So there's there's a fine line. It depends on how much you're eating. It depends on, you know, are you on a renal diet? Do you need a kidney diet? Do you have got a lot of salt? You know, are you on a low protein diet? Are you on a sodium diet? Are you on a diet for your heart? Are you just a heart failure? You know, you're taking water. Oh, so not let me forget about water. Okay. Um, so it depends on how much you drink. I tell my patients a super easy way to always know you're hydrated. The color of your urine should look like the color of the sky. Winter, spring, fall, summer, the heat outside on the beach, playing volleyball, if you're in a sauna, if you're in a hot room in the winter time with your heater on, doesn't matter. The color of your urine should always be the same. That's hydration. If your urine is the color of water, you're overhydrated. Okay, that's way too much water. It's clear. Your body's just saying, oh my God, you gave me so much water, I'm just get rid of it. Okay. If it looks like the color of tea, which don't see it sometimes, sometimes I've got to work on it, especially with masks. I knew it was very hard. And I'm still a mask doctor. Um, you know, when you sit down, you eat, it's very concentrated, you're not taking enough water. So it's really an easy, down and dirty, simple, moment to moment. I sat down, I eat, if you see the first morning tea, you're not up all night. Your first morning tea is probably the strongest color because you've been fasting all night, right, for eight hours. You have an eight hour sleep and you wake up, you know, when you're the first tea. One, the volume's a lot because you mobilize all the food and grab it from home. And you haven't been drinking, so it's more concentrated. During the day, just look at the color of your ear and you want to measure your food. How do your lips feel? How does your tongue feel? You're not going to drop. Those, those are things that you can do with as internal gauges, as opposed to, I need to drink my eight glasses of water. Well, I don't need to eat eight, drink eight glasses of water when I'm on my computer doing charting for eight hours, right? Or what, writing up my lecture, which is exercise. Um, you know, or if I'm sitting there watching TV with my kids and just hanging out, right? But when I'm running my three miles, I need more than eight glasses, right? I usually don't do eight glasses because you know, you know, but then I'm going to want to get up and I'm going to want to drink eight to a liter of water, right? Um, and for me, I don't drink plain water. I don't get less to like to it. I, I like I like the balance. Um, I'm not plain. I don't like to do that. So but I always think it's always nice to have some minerals, you know, a little bit of potassium, a little bit of magnesium, you know, a little bit of vitamin C in there. Give it good flavor and also um, keeps, um, as, as my patients get older, sometimes if you just drink a lot of clean water, your sodium can actually decrease. Give up some drinking your drinking just to help the patient keep it. So, what is it made for chloride? So, chloride can be a lot of it, could be a part of your acid base. So, the volume is always low. I was doing it the way. I'm not very how low is it? And you might just see your acid base. It's not a lot. It's like, you know, one point, but it's mm -hmm. not really normal. Do you take um, post on pump inhibitor for anything for gastric acid? I'm not on any. Okay, I'm not even to accept it. Oh, is it the acid acid or something? Yeah, and, um, I don't know. You know, because if we look at chloride, it's mainly like high sport acid, it's predominantly in our stomach. So sometimes our patients just have um, post on pump inhibitor. I thought it 
ahead and do the walk the Bible. No, no. So, you know, if you really, you know, if you really want to look at your citation set, you would look at um, the specific gravity of the word. Yeah, I don't even remember those numbers I can use. Whatever, whatever the specific citation is. I, no, I don't, I don't use that um, clinically for myself. You know, for clinic, clinical stuff, I try to keep it, you know, not too technical. I try to just use the citation set as you need it. You know, if I wanted to you know, go do algorithms and math, like would that involve them if you were stressing time? Looking for something to start out on and maybe so it's it, absolutely what and so that's the one thing I can give before I do any like fancy testing like real dynamics. You know, so both of the tough drugs, you have to titrate it up. You have to take a 24 like stairs, you have to take a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more over a few days. You have to tell you, they just side effects of the one step. And then if you don't like it, you have to step it down. You can't just stop it because people the brain won't like that. Okay, you might vomit. So I like to get up to about 80 milligrams a day. So I might do 20 milligrams in three to five days, you know, my patient does. Then in the bottle, she can take two pills that meant three to five days, and we should tolerate that. She bumped it up to 60. And anywhere between 60 and 100, sometimes it's 120. I never got to 60, but I think it's just yeah. I, my, my sweet spot is 80. My patients are 80. Even those who are, are already on a depression. And it works 80% of the time. I, I think it's a, it's a really nice medication. Um, as long as you take it, as long as it works. So what is it? So it's a, it's a, it's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It has some of those properties, some of those same properties of like Lexapro and Prozac and all of those antidepressant drugs that are really fancy. And it has that type of a, um, chemical that stimulates, and those receptors are those little people that are like, oh, I, you know, if you take that chemical, you activate me, they're going to give you the health and it tightens them up. Why are those receptors there? I don't know. <laughs> those are those are feel good receptors in our brain, right? They make us euphoric and happy. You have your letter too. You do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it needs to be monitored. You know, then once I get my patient out of maintenance, then I keep them on it for whenever they want, right? You know, as long as they want. It can be a little bit expensive. Um, less expensive now that time has gone on, but about 10 years ago, oh my gosh, it's so cost prohibitive and costly. Three hundred dollars a month. Now they have an extended release dose. Um, some of my patients go to 60 milligrams or 20, um, they combine that to an 80. Well, did that answer your question? Yeah, I just didn't remember what it was. What was it with sleep? What were sleep? So, a sling is just, you know, everybody remember all the cartoons where they kids and they have to swing a shot, right? They put a little cup in and you swing it across. And Yes. So if you think about your gut letter Y, right? And then you have that rubber band, okay? And that's the rubber band that you pull back. Okay. Keep in mind that rubber band. That's the same. So here's your bladder. And I'm going to tie it because I don't want it to be inflated. Okay. So know where your reef from is this, even though I put it not, because we're your reef from the bottom. When I put in a sling, think about that rubber band. That rubber band is a U going around this way. And it holds pressure right here, like that. So if my bladder's in my body like this, that's about the size of my bladder. It goes from inside the vagina to out the pubic bone, like that. And why? So if it's a sling, Here's the urethra. You see where it's holding pressure? Now, when she coughs, so I always use the analogy of a garden hose. So, when she coughs, this patient, she coughs, she laughs, she sneezes. This is going to keep, right? Now, if this balloon was filled with air and I keep it, it would lose air a lot less, just like the bladder would lose less water, less urine, right? 
Then when it's back into its anatomy, you can pee, right? If you have the angle of straight there, now you cough, you engage it, it pees. You push the pee, it pees, you can't empty. You cough, you laugh, you sneeze, it pees, you cannot empty. Then you relax, and that tube that you reach runs straight again. Now you can pee. So you see the coughing mechanism engages it. It's just like a little kid swimming, right? So it's like you inside your heart. I make an incision this big inside the vagina. I tunnel up behind the pubic bone and it comes out by the skin. Right in the body. If this was my black, this was the document. The sleep material is much. That's the lighter to the lens. Like these things are really simple for people can understand. You know, we're going to do this graphic. But I also think graphics can help to remember stuff. I took a lighter sleep and melt. It's plastic. But it's hospital grade. It's, it's people grade. It's meant to be inside your body. And it's meant to be inside your vagina. So what does it look like? Okay, so I know it melts. I know it's the shape of a sleep. But what does it look like? I went to a roll of tape. And I was going to tape this balloon to the wall. And I went to my scotch tape roll. And I pulled a piece of tape out. And that tape was that long, right? That tape is that long, so I want that length. It's going to be that wide and that thin. That is what the measurement looks like. Except it's a lattice. Does everybody know what a chain link fence looks like? Right? So you have all the holes. Now take a chain link fence with those big holes. You can also put a little square against it because it's stuck on the other side of the neighbor. Help the baseball fell over it. Pick it up. But now take those chain links and make them. It's still like you know, like panty holes, mesh, but it's thin. And it is the length, the width, and the you know, thickness of tape that you take off the tape itself. And the shape of it goes like a letter U, starting from inside the vagina, coming out the body, and supporting the mid urethral area. And as you saw, when it gets engaged, it keeps that urethra, like you keep the garden hose. You know, you ever want to move the garden hose onto a different part of the lawn? You don't just go up there and let it get you all wet and you're like, ah, you're trying to move it. We can do that when you're a kid. When you're older, you don't want to get wet. You bring your clothes to what works. You keep the garden hose and then you like hobble on over. You move the garden hose over here and then you set it down and you let go and then you unkink it and it sprinkles. Same thing like this. When it keeps that urethra, the urine doesn't come out. When you unkink it, you can see. Okay, so simple thing. Very simple, same, same, same type of uh, mechanisms for our body. Does that make sense? So that's what it looks like. That's how it functions. And as we get older, we want to be careful. We want to be careful. So if you're obstructed and stepping on that garden pole, that pressure comes to help get that water through that way. I was more interested in. And I have to apologize. I have a
I didn't wake up after sleeping all night and not drinking that much. You know, so I, I know I'm going to drink. I know this much went in. At least half of that's going to come out. And maybe in half an hour, maybe in an hour. So I'm going to make myself available in an hour. I'm going to go and I'm going to sit down before I have the urge. I'm going to rest and sit down on the toilet. Even if it's not so wet. Because I'm going to tell my bladder what to go, not my bladder. But I'm going to get up and I'm going to go about my day. Later on, you can have our you might go back to your urge and you're really still. You can go back to the toilet. But you're going to start training your bladder. You can start going before you get the urge. So that's called bladder training before you get the, before you get the urge. So you're going to time it. I drank this much water. I know I'm going to have to go in an hour. I'm going to go sit down on the toilet every hour before I have to go. And you're going to start training yourself to go. And, and it, you know, so the, when my patients are going to do that, then they usually go to physical therapists because then you go over diabetes and more frequently, and then they'll help you start sleeping and stuff. And then you start making it long. Then I can go an hour and a half before my bladder. But the trick is you want to pee before your bladder tells you not. And I'll tell you, a lot of my patients are like, you know what, Dr. Perla? I'm like, I drink that water. Right before I get the urge, I'm gonna walk over. And as I'm walking over, I'm like, oh my God, I gotta go. They're thinking about it, right? But they're already on their way. So it's funny because even just thinking about food makes your bladder run. So a lot of my patients, they it works for them because they're they've already mobilized. I have a patient who takes me five minutes to stand up out of that chair. I had a patient the other day, you know, she was on. What did she have? It's fine with this girl. It was very, very minor. She was in a walker and um, she had had surgery. And I said, Well, of course you're going to pee on yourself. She said, The only time I pee on myself is in the morning. I said, Well, of course you do. So, what do you mean, of course I do? I'm like, You're in a walker. You, are you jumping out of bed and running to the toilet after not being up all night? You're full. It probably takes you five or ten minutes to get out of bed. She's like, wow, I never thought about that. I'm like, of course, you've got to find your walker, you've got to pull it over, you've got to take a leg, you've got to put a leg over, you've got to put your other leg over, you've got to roll out of bed. You're leaky. I'm like, put a commode at your bedside. It takes you five minutes to get up, then you just get up and you're going to roll over. She was so happy. I'm like, it's not work from back in the She's like, I got surgery, I did great. But that's the only problem is what you want to take medicine for one second. We have to think about like what we do with our life, right? I drink, I know if it goes in, it's going to come. I know that if I have a cup of tea and a cup of water, a cup of coffee and a cup of water, that has diabetic. Already, you can let me finish up with diabetic. Diuretic. Everybody who's on a diuretic gets up in the morning and takes their diuretic, right? Remember, I told you that when you get up in the morning, the shoes. Are loose because that is the time you have a loose amount of swelling in your body. Some of you need to try to write. You haven't retained any fluids yet. You're not going to start retaining fluids until the gravity has worked on your body, maybe midday, maybe two o'clock in the afternoon. Take your diet rest, two or three o'clock in the afternoon. Because then you're going to reduce, you're going to excrete all that excess fluid. So by the time it's 10 o'clock at night, you're back to being able to be awake. You just have to remember that when you take your diuretic, it will be for four to six hours in the floor. So if you have something in the afternoon, two or four or five o'clock, and you're taking your diuretic, you don't have a bath. Don't be in the car, right? But some of my patients, they say, I take a diuretic and I can't leave my house all morning, right? Because they got up, they had their coffee, they had their cereal with milk or their oatmeal, and then they had a glass of water, they had to take their medicine, and then they were their medicine with their diuretic, they had three, four cups of fluid. They can't leave the toilet because they're just like in the diuretic. And the diuretic doesn't even help them because the diuretic only works on swelling. And again, you don't swell at the end of the day, right? So take it later. And that'll help you not get up at night. The gentleman is back that question. So if you have a diuretic and you're getting up at night, maybe you can stop the back about pushing once the time is fine. So we can stay with our question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Um, my friends. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. 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 Thank
they are the best treatment for fecal incontinence because a lot of the incontinence are surgical and they're overlapping muscles. And those, they, they have some complications and the success rates are like 20%. Success rate for Anderson, which is a bad immune plant that goes here, from 70%, and you're not going to be served at this more skin, which is phenomenal. It's all nervous. It's all making those folks that all in is going to transfer from these more big items. So some people not only have liquid stool, they have um, incontinence of gas, or even a particulate matter being some, some stool will actually come out. I have a girl in medical school, she was going to be a, a, a physician, my best was so funny. She just used an patent of gas. So we'd all be sitting there studying and we'd hear, like, okay, sorry. Like, okay. But then, I'm okay today. Like, okay. Because <laughs> she had these patents of gas. And, you know, it, it, was, it was just the way it was. You know, it was very loud. And, you know, we all knew. Just the way it was. She was all right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I didn't hear the project, but you know what I'm saying? Um, so neural guys only do female, but if you're not, they do, they do the neural implant stimulators. So, some of us, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm asking, but I know that I have some data that I've gotten out of some way around. Are you up to date on your school? Yeah, I've had, I've, since I had cancer, I've had it for a few years in a row, I had it in a row, but that's been, that's been a, oh, now a while, but I've been out of it. I haven't had cancer for eight years. Do you know the name of the person? I I like the Southwest Bureau of Neurology. It's um Dr. Ike, Dr. Berger, that group. They're just they're young guys, they're all men. Um, they're very nice. They're just you know, and most of the patients that go there are men. Um, they they have some some you know most of the females that go to this class real science are just men. None of them are men. Is that murder out of right? No, it's a mix of that speed means. Oh, yeah. This, it, so Dr. Murder is very handsome. <laughs> it's like I can't always say that. I'm like, you're lucky you have all guys. Because the women would hit on all day. He's a very nice kid. They're all very nice guys. And this, they're just a great surgeon, really gifted, very good hands. I have seen them operate. They're all amazing. Very nice. It's good to be a, a surgeon and good ethical people. I like them. But it's always an option. Yeah, that's the idea. Anything else? So I'll see if um, I, this was great. You know, last time I did this, three people came and um, it was a couple of years pre COVID. So this is nice that everybody came. Thank you so much for coming out and listening to my ramble. <laughs> I love teaching and I love talking about. Stuff that can always help everybody. So I hope that will be informative. Can help with the uh, um, anal issues as well. Mm -hmm. the, the perineal body can definitely be nice people. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to it's hard to engage them for hours on end, and that's the problem with kegels. So if you have an issue that's random, yeah. that you know you don't you can't predict, yeah. and it and it occurs. It's not like you can kegel. It's like if I wanted to walk around like this all day. I'm going to walk around like this all day. Just all day, right? No one can do that, right? And so you're asking your body to try to remember to kegel all day. Maybe you remember for 15 seconds, a minute, you know, and then, it, and then you forget your muscles fatigue, you know. So the kegel, when you when you stimulate it with the nerve, with the, with the electricity, you know, it's like it's like when you get taped. You see the way they get taped, like, <laughs> so it's like a little taser. You know, sending a little tiny jolts of electricity to the, the muscles, and then they contract. Mm -hmm. And it's programmed, and it's programmed to be at a certain frequency and a, at a certain, like, um, uh, not just frequency, but strength, right? So you might stimulate like this, or you might do a long, short, long, short. You might get to how many ohms or how strong that contraction is. There are all sorts of patterns depending on someone and how they respond to the, to the stimulate. And that's kind of what they did for this paralyzed guy, which I just think is, I'm still in awe. Like, I just, you know, I mean, this is like, that's just, that changes, that changes so much for so many people's lives. You know, they walk, but it did, you know. Can you say, you know, I think I went to your place. Is it a nice place? Um, so there's Denise Seltzer, and then there's me, Denise Rebel. Okay. 
I mean, I don't think that's why you like, but I just like the uh, So if you went to a big center, that would be a tell so I would move to I'm on a 95th by the men's warehouse. I'm in a very small alcove area. Um, but if you could get like a little So if you, if you went to see also, and she probably was up on the top. Well, of and luckily I did. She put me on your little and here's the big one. Yeah. May I help you? Yeah. I am surprised. Yeah. You know, it is surprising. So that was the kind of situation. Yep. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's surprising, like what? Yeah. Why? Yeah, so that's why I put it up there because right. I really don't think about that as a, as a cause for comfort in confidence or even urgency or frequency. Remember, our bones don't move, right? Our, 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 pelvis, our pelvis is fixed. You can only put so many marbles in before they start spilling out. And if it's all filled with marbles of poop, there's no room for urine in the bladder. Bladder cancer is very rare. I've seen them doing this last year. I've seen a little bit more of it than I'm pushing the population from the center. And things from cold to black to cold to the black hair. So I'm proud of this whole thing. Black cancer is just a very few less than small. But typically, I'm very seldom get to black cancer in there. Very seldom. Most of the time, you know, it's just an incident. It's just super small. Not to say that I don't always go. Right? Because, you know, you always find stuff. You know, you know I have an oncologist. I for all my patients, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm doing this. So how do you send me so many people? You don't ask, you don't look, you don't look at it. You gotta do the test, you know, and you've done a lot of work, but you know, it's you know, early prevention, right? So you have to do it. Uh, in what cases do you use the mouth? Or no urgency. Urgency is a sensation. Yeah. Stress. Oh, stress is not. Yeah. Like when you turn the mask off, like, like what? Like, that's urge. That's urge. Anything you can feel. Okay. If you feel like you have to pee, if you know you have to pee, if you think you have to pee, if you get up because you have to pee because you feel your bladder full, urge. Right. If it's a stress, like a cough and jump in motion. It's a physical activity. It's a stress on your body. Jump up and down, run up a flight of stairs, I have a cross ice in I laugh. If I have this one flat in my office because I laugh so hard, tears came down my face. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you found about the health control. It does. It does help with that. And it's very successful. It's just, it's just a it, some people it's cost prohibitive and some people don't tolerate it. But in my experience, I have very few patients who don't tolerate it. Most of the people I have ever put it on have done fine. They might not have liked to take it because they didn't, you know, maybe they can get up to a high enough dose or they just got tired of taking the medicine, but it always works. Okay. My mother took it on. My mom had it before. Oh. And she had it at 30. Terrible symptoms. Okay. We have a new drug out. It works very well for them. She was in is it the new refet the new form of refetra? Because that was that was really expensive. I don't you know, I don't she's actually an example of what kind of she can afford. But she said it works it's very well. Mm -hmm. That's refetra. Mm -hmm. You like it? Okay. Nice, it's a good job. Just gotta watch your blood pressure. Did you do a blood pressure? Did you know, sometimes so. Mm -hmm. Sometimes refetra works. With the drug from the other class as well. You know what? I was reading about this. Yes, you do both. So then you're on two drugs. You're on a better to make your make a left or a better. I don't know. So I think I tried that to say, or I tried try to use it in. Two more times. Don't you have a doctor who is full of great anesthesia? No, no, no. You're off. I'm just having a referral problem right now. So once I get my I get my staff up and my whole system out here covered, my care covered, they pay for it. They need to do it right. So you can do it right in the office. Yeah. I think okay. Medicare short Medicare shorts in like five bucks. It's such a jerk. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you can't give me five bucks for Starbucks Medicare. Five or two bucks. And and what what kind of incontinence does that do? Urge, 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 and or nocturnal. You know, urgency, frequency, whether you're driving.
why you're here wet and it works awesome. You know, I have a few patients that they just need MC, but most of the times I have to get over it by either double voiding me and they go pee and then they're like, okay, I know I'm not MC because they have to put on push the bed. And I'll let them push because they don't have a sleep, they have both. And then after two weeks, then they have to keep sleeping and they're fine. So I, you know, I did this proud sometimes where they don't have to. Yeah, so I can push. Did you have your own thing? You should. You should be by your bladder, by your bladder flow. So if you do both tracks, then then you can get it. Only if you, you know, that might be a sunscreen problem. It may not be an actual physical problem. It may be I just have that, I just feel that. So it depends, you know. So I have some patients who are very concerned about those tracks. So I start I start with little three and fifty units instead of hundred. You know, you can back in three months, you do 100 if you like. Or you do 50 all the time. I let them kind of, you know, see things, you see, you know. But 100 is, is the standard dose. I tell them that they're really worried about not empty. Because maybe I have a few patients back to say that. They're like, oh, you know, I took a medicine and I didn't empty all the time. I said, oh, you can have those and you can do the other. You know, if you don't, then, you know, the side effects of the tension are much better. So, what can I do for it? Depends. I have some patients who come in every year, and I have some patients who come in every three months. It works well. It does work well. Yeah. yeah. And like you said, if you're seven, mine lasts a whole year. Yeah. And it's only, my last I said, quite long. But it's done a lot. It makes a big difference. It works really well. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. I have one patient who gets back. And so, you know, she, <laughs> she sat in the chair on the way up. Why don't you warn your patients? She's like, Am I the only one? I said, Yeah, you're the only one ever cried. She's like, No. And I said, Yeah. I said, but it's okay. You know, stay here and, you know, you feel better. She's like, I'm such a baby. She had breast cancer. She just had a lot of anxiety. She's just an anxious woman. She's real sensitive. She keeps blood drawing. She's like, you know, tears are coming down. And she's like, and I'm the only one. Said, yeah, you're the only one. I'm telling my patients that somebody definitely has discomfort. But for the most part, like everybody I've ever done has been like, wow, that's great. Thanks, Dr. Perlon. See you later. Kind <laughs> of jump out of the table. Yeah. Right? It, it yeah. doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Yeah, we, love, we, we put a light cream liquid on oh, the oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I. I let my patients sit around for like 45 minutes with a mummy okay. on their bladder. If they go pee, then we just take them into the room and then we'll start. But if they can hold it, then it kind of is a topical anesthetic. They can take some um, motion or leave, you know, or Tylenol or both. But most of my anesthetic, I don't even like it. It's, it's like giving a shot. So if I gave you 10 shots, how long would that take you in your arm? One, two, three. I think one, five minutes, three minutes. 180 seconds, like it is very fast. She's in a surgery. Oh my God. And, and yeah. I'm, I'm mad because insurance makes our patients take two medicines and fail two medicines before they approve it. I think Medicare is just one, but you have to say a patient is taking this medicine and it didn't do it. So if I have a patient who comes in and they say, Dr. Perlo, I have a red flag, give me both tracks. I tell them, yes, but your insurance will not pay for it until you have tried and failed. What's a failure? I don't tolerate the medicine because my dry mouth is so bad. I get constipation or it doesn't work. Those are all failures. I tell my patients, you don't have to take it. You just have to buy this to sell the bottle. You can do whatever you want with it. You can just come and tell me it doesn't work. I don't care. If you have to sell, the trials have to be well. Anytime during your care? No, anytime in your life. I, I do have patients who come to me and they're like, Oh, you know, I, I just came from another doctor, you know, tried four different medicines. And, you know, sometimes it's primary care. You know, they don't do Botox, they don't do procedures. So they get sent to me. I said, I've tried all these medicines, nothing's worked. You know, I, I know you do Botox, or I know you do this, let's pursue it. Most of the time they come in and say, I want to explain. And I say, well, you know, let's do some tests and see what surgery is appropriate. And typically it's Botox, you know. And we can do the battery implant stimulator. My friend, exclusively does a bladder stimulator. I do not, um, I think it's just a matter of personal preference. I, I just personally, like in my mind, for me, it's more invasive for a person, but that's just my own bias. 
And I just think it's easier to keep all the cuts, but you know, if you do the better you don't have single layer, it's you know five to seven years, depending on which brand you get. And I think the new ones are six to seven years. And I don't even know if that's right. So it, it lasts forever. You just put it in and you're done. And in five years, you go and you get the little incision, the tiny little incision. The, the battery implant is small, it's about that big, and it's really thin. You can't feel it, especially because it's chunky. And, uh, and then you pop it out and put a brand new battery in five, you know, six years. It's just a really nice product because you don't have to go into the back to do the box. So when you can get seen, you don't have to have anything done. You know, so better than sling. So that's again urgent comment. And then sling, you know, for sling treatment options, it's going to be sling, pessary, urethral bumping agent, kegel, and physical therapy. That's it. And, and some bulk. Uh, so I have some patients, I don't think it's patients, but I think it's patients. No, a lot of 30, 40 year olds, they don't want to take a vaccine for their 40 year old. You know, they're certain. I don't care what they do, but I always tell them, well, you know, if you want to be committed to, you know, 80 milligrams of Cymbalta, you know, you're 40 years old, what, six years, you know, your life, your, your mouth's 94, and, you know, you want to take something for the next 50, 40 years and still living. So, you know, I kind of, I kind of help them understand you know, where they are in their life and, and, and where their next chapter is going to be and how they can kind of gauge what their treatment should be. You know, then why not get surgery? You know, you're going to get, you're really going to get the longevity of it, right? She's well, your mom, yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. For sure, your mom is going to be, yeah, she will get the complication of high, as well as, you know, uh, the consequences of other complications. Oh, okay. Go no attack. She's very nice. Like you said, it's right now. And I always tell my patients, I gave you all 100 units. I did not take any for my pros. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Furlong. Thanks for being here. It was really, really informative. Oh. It was. <laughs> I like, I like uh, you know, I've, always, I've always enjoyed teaching. Like, I have a lot of friends that. It's funny because my, I told my kids when they were little, I, said, I always wanted a homeschool. They're like, no, <laughs> no, we want to go to school, mom. I'm like, what? <laughs> They're like, yeah, you know, your, your curriculum would be too intense. 